been asked to give my testimony, and that's always a, something of a fearful thing, because with our testimonies, we're uh, prone at times to become self-centered and self-absorbed, and to uh, even present ourselves in such a way as to appear a victim who was then rescued by Christ rather than a culprit that was rescued by Christ. I have found out uh, from looking at men, from studying the scriptures, and from looking in the mirror of my own life that men love to speak about themselves. And um, so we must always really be careful with regard to uh, our testimonies. Um, I was raised um, on a... uh, ranch, farm. We raised cattle and quarter horses. So I was kind of raised as something of a farm boy and a cowboy. And um, my father was an, was an unbeliever. My mother was a believer. But I have uh, a long heritage of uh, people in my family who uh, served the Lord. My mother was Croatian and uh, my grandmother was a Croatian Christian and because of her faith uh, suffered greatly. Um, If you are Croatian, you are Catholic. Extremely Catholic. Um, And my grandmother was converted so in leaving Catholicism it was a sense of also being a traitor to Croatian culture. But what made matters worse is she, um, the only evangelical church that existed at the time was Serbian and the Croats and the Serbs have a great war against one another over the centuries and so for her to become a part of that made it even worse and but through her life my mother was converted at the age of 12 as she saw how her mother suffered for Christ um, My grandfather and grandmother on my father's side were some of the first Baptist missionaries to the country of of, uh, Brazil in in Mindanao. Um, Before I was born, uh, I was preceded by a brother, uh, my brother Doug, and um, my father literally, as he wrote in one of his letters, worshipped the ground that my brother walked on. And um, a few years ago, I discovered a correspondence from my father and my grandfather. It was actually a letter from my grandfather, and he said this, Bob, that was my dad's name, he said, I greatly fear for you, and I fear for your boy. For I've heard you say that you worship the ground that boy walks on. Our great God will not tolerate idols in the life of any man. Uh, my brother ran into the street one day and was run over by a car, and uh, he was killed. And there's a real sense in which my dad also died with him. And um, he was everything for my father. And, and I grew up kind of in shadow of that. Uh, and it was, it was very, very difficult, to be honest with you. It was extremely difficult. And um, so there on the, the farm, the ranch, uh, my father was an unbeliever. There's one gift that he really gave me. He taught me how to work. He taught me how to work hard. As a matter of fact, when I was 12 years old, I was taken to the hospital. And I remember the doctor chewing out my father saying, you're going to kill that boy. I've never seen a boy in this kind of condition. His back and everything else. I got to stop him so hard. But you know, it was, in a sense, it was really, really hard. But in a sense, it was one of the greatest gifts. I went to a very, not a very good preschool or a very good high school, and I wasn't uh, really a student who applied himself at all. But I remember when I went to college, my first year, first class, English class, they asked me to write a paragraph. That was the first assignment. I flunked it. I, I didn't know how to write a paragraph. But um, at the end of the semester, I had an A in the class. Why? Because the one thing my father had given me was work. You just work until you do it. That's that's all there is to it. And and that's a good lesson also for the parents here today, that especially those who homeschool, I know we want to give our children Latin and calculus and all these different things, but the most important thing you can give your child is Christ and character. Give them character. They can accomplish anything. They can start at the bottom of the class, but they'll go forward if they're taught to work. Um, my father was a person who really pushed me. Um, I was something, not a very good athlete, but I was an athlete, and if I scored 20 points in a game, it was, you could have scored 30. If I 
made a certain score in something, you could have done better, and this is how you could have done it. And it was always, always that. The glass was always seemed to be half empty. And um, it was really, really difficult. He was a very angry man, very powerful man, very strong man. Very, he, was, he could be frightening. I saw my dad one time in a situation. Six men approached him, got in an argument with him, and, and my father looked at all six of them, and he went like this. He said, you know me, I'll whip all six of you at one time, I'll do it right here, and you know I can do it. And they backed down. I mean, he, he, was, he was really something. But he was just always angry, always unfulfilled, no matter what happened. It just wasn't good enough. And you see that, when you don't have Christ in your life, that's just the way it is. Nothing will ever satisfy a man except Christ. Our relationship was very, very difficult. I lived in a great deal of fear. And then when I was about 16 years old, it seemed like things started to change. My father and I began to have a really a better relationship. I was, as a boy, I was always really small, the runt of the litter. I know I didn't live up to my older brother. But yet when I turned 16, it seemed like everything changed. I think I grew a foot that year, put on some weight, and, and I was more something that my father could be proud of. And uh, so things were going well. And one day we were working on the ranch. I had just turned 17, and we were running wire. Now, here in Rhode Island, you may not know what that is, but you take a big roll of bobbed wire, and you run a steel pole through it, and one man gets on one side, and the other gets on the other, and you're running wire to build a fence for horses or cattle. And we're talking as we're walking along. We're even laughing. We're having a good time. And all of a sudden, he screamed. And when he screamed, I caught him, and we both fell to the ground. And when I rolled him over, he was dead. He had died of a massive heart attack. Now, um, at that point, everything in my life changed. Everything. I, was, uh, I wasn't a Christian, but I was kind of known as, a, well, a good guy, you know. And uh, within a matter of weeks, I would come to school drunk. Uh, I ended up getting kicked off the basketball team that I was captain of. Just all sorts of things. Now, people look at that and they'd say, wow. The, and, the, and they did. They looked at that and said, this poor kid. No, not at all. See, we've been taught to think he's a victim of his father's death. That's not true. My father's death gave my wicked flesh the opportunity to do what it had always wanted to do. There was no authority. I could just live now. I was getting bigger. I was getting stronger. No one tell me what to do. And so, I wasn't a victim. I was a culprit. And although I appeared to be a good boy, I wasn't a good boy inside. It's just I had a very strong authority figure over me. And for you children that are homeschooled, you need to realize something. It may be your mother and father's authority and wisdom and even their relationship with Christ that's holding your morality in check or your immorality in check. Just because you're homeschooled or this or that doesn't mean that you're a godly person. You can fake it and not even know that you're faking it. And then when that authority figure is moved out of your life, you become a wild person. Well, no, you don't really become a wild person. You just start manifesting what you've always been secretly. So if you see that in yourself this morning, run to Christ. Amen. Run to Christ. You see... So, uh, I graduated from high school, didn't know what I was going to do. And one day I was at the courthouse for some reason there in town. And my basketball coach and one of the teachers at school, he looked at me and goes, Hey, Washer, you going into the Army? I said, I don't know why. He said, because that's the only place you could go, either there or prison. And it made me so mad. He said, because you can't function in outside society. And it made me so mad 
that I went, I went and called a student counselor, even though it, we, I'd already graduated, a really nice lady at our school, and I met with her at her home, and I said, I want to go to the university somewhere. So I got into a, a university, a good one, small one, but very good. And um, you know how people will try to glorify in some way, you know, I was a fighter, I was a drinker, I was this, I was that. I was just the most self-centered, egotistical, vain jerk of a person you've ever met in your life. It was just all about me. I wanted to make good grades, to become a lawyer, to make a lot of money. Lifted weights three hours a day because I wanted to be bigger and stronger than all the other guys. I did whatever I could do to be the center of attention. I just always wanted to be a superhero. Just vanity. Vanity. And the more you give yourself to that, the more ridiculous you look. Just, you know, the emperor has no clothes. And I just went on with that. And then, as you do that, you give yourself more and more over to delusion. And, and you begin to lie. I was one of the greatest liars you've ever met in your life. I can remember one time lying. To, uh, I went with a friend of mine. He said, man, I don't want to work tomorrow. It's going to be so beautiful. I said, no problem. Let's go talk to our boss. And so I went in there and I made up the biggest story just right off the, just right off the cuff. One of the biggest lies in the world. And we walked out and my friend looked at me, my best friend, and he says, you know, you're scary. You are scary. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, I knew you were lying and I believed you. And, and, and I did that. But one of the most wonderful things is God did not allow my conscience to be seared. The deeper I came into my own vanity, the more I hated myself. The darker I saw myself. And then the working of the Holy Spirit, of just, just, just everything is a lie. Well, I transferred from the school because um, I decided that I was going to be an oil and gas lawyer, so I went to the University of Texas. And I thought, this is a new opportunity. I'm going to be a different person when I go there. Well, you know how that went. I was not a different person. It just took a matter of weeks and I was caught in the same lies. I was having to live something totally fake. Just, just everything. And I just realized I'm trapped. I can't change. And sometimes, and I don't know if you've done this, but I would get up in the morning to go to class. And I can remember just going in, you know, be dark, turn on the light of the bathroom, turn on the shower, and standing there in the shower and such darkness, not outside in the room, but in me. It was like an absolute hopelessness. Why? why? I mean, it wasn't a philosophical, why am I alive? It was just darkness. There's no hope. There's, there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. And um, because I, I, I loved myself, and I wanted to be the center of everyone's attention. Um, I lifted weights. I, just, I lived to lift weights. And I, I was on steroids. Just. And I can remember one night, it was one in the morning, I couldn't sleep, and I had a bottle of pills in my hands, and I was just looking at them, and I said to myself, you know, I know these wouldn't kill me if I took them all at one time, but I do wish I had something that would do that. I am so miserable. And I kept saying over and over, I am the most, I remember it was the word, I am the most miserable human being that, on this planet. And, um, you know, outside, uh, for some of you who may be thinking that the world is really a cool thing, I, I took a big part in that cool stuff. I mean, I was was well known as a guy that you to hang around with. You know, I always laugh when I think of, you know, I, I knew very beautiful people. Models and this and that. And I always laugh whenever I see a model on a, on a uh, billboard. Because I'll tell young men, you see that beautiful woman there? 
They say, yeah. I said, I've seen her at four in the morning with her head in a toilet throwing up. I've seen her without her makeup. And you know, I've, I've, I've seen that. I've, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And it's just, unless, unless God sears your conscience, no matter how beautiful that life appears on the outside, it's, it's the most disgusting thing in the world on the inside. And um, I just knew my life was miserable. But I think the worst thing about it is, is I knew my life was just a fabrication. It was all a lie. And, and I knew I was in bondage because someone could ask me a simple question and I couldn't tell them the truth. I would just make up something because I knew I could. And uh, that's why my friend said, man, you're going to make a great lawyer. <laughs> and I used to think to myself, yeah, I'll end up in jail. Or suicide. You know, I, I knew I would have. And, um, and, and so I was sitting there on the bed and it's like 1, 1.30 in the morning and there's a knock at the door. And I'm like, what that is? So I open up the door and there's, it was an apartment complex, university students. I open up the door and there's this guy there about this tall, a freshman, and he's just like shaking. I'm like looking at him. And he said, uh, you're probably going to beat me up. And I looked at him and I said, you know you're probably right. And... And he goes, but I've got to tell you something. And I'm thinking, man, this guy, something's wrong with him. You know? He goes, I've got to tell you something. And I said, okay. He goes, I can't take it anymore. I'm afraid of you, but I'm more afraid of God, and I can't take it anymore. I'm like, okay, what? He goes, for two weeks, God has been telling me to come over and tell you something, and I've been afraid to do it, but I can't sleep, and I've got to tell you. I'm like... This is, I'm like, you're really freaking me out. <laughs> and I said, okay, look, just kind of funny. I go, okay, what's God got to tell me? This is what he said. You are miserable and you are going to remain miserable until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And I mean, it was like, you, it was like he hit me with a truck. Because I, I thought to myself, you know, when I was thinking I'm the most miserable human, I wasn't saying that out loud. He couldn't have heard that through the door. And so for, until about 4.30 in the morning, we just walked around campus and he would tell me stuff. And, and I looked at him and I said, look, I know the Catholic Church and I know the Baptist and I know they're both on you know, opposite sides. I know both those groups and I don't want anything to do with any of them. And this is what he said. He said, that's fine. But I'm not talking about Catholic and I'm not talking about Baptist. I am talking about the person of Jesus Christ. And I'm sorry, you can't escape from this one. What are you going to do with Him? And it really began to... I think about it. I just thought about it and thought about it. And my mom had put an old King James Bible in my, in my suitcase and I found it in my apartment somewhere looking for it. Had it shoved somewhere. And I opened up the Bible. It was a few days later, and it, it said this. I opened it up to a passage. It says, Man's days are like grass. As the flower of the field, so he flourishes. And the wind passes over him. He is no more. And the place acknowledges him no more. And it made me angry because I sat there and I went, I know this. This is part of my problem. Because I remember my father. He was very smart, very powerful, very respected. Yet when he died, I remember... The, the funeral, when people came to see that night, I saw men talking about their business, I t his best friends, some of them even laughing. You know, they, they, they were sincere, but it was like my dad died and everybody's gone on with their life. And I thought to myself, that's exactly the way it's going to be with me. It's the way it is with everybody. You're just grass. You die. And so I took the Bible and I just put it down like that quickly. And I just said, basically, thanks God for telling me something I already knew. But then I picked it back up again after a few minutes. And it said, but the, the loving kindness of the Lord is everlasting on those who fear Him. And the everlasting is the part that just stood out to me. And so I would read some, I would listen to this guy some. And 
And I began to kind of understand something about the gospel. And then one day, I'm at the uh, undergraduate library at the University of Texas. We're running off some oil surveys because we had this team. We competed against other teams there in the university. You know, this classroom situation in which you're these mock-up companies and you have to do all the different things from oil surveys to accounting. And, and uh, so we're running off some surveys there. And one of the girls, the only girl on our team, comes up to me and she goes, Hey, I'm having a party. Uh, tomorrow night, why don't you come? And I had gone through that stage of partying and everything, but I had gotten to the point where I no longer partied. I just went to a bar, you know, I mean a bar, old guys, you know, I just went to a bar, I would sit there and drink myself blind. I could go for two weeks without talking to a person. I just didn't care anymore. And I don't even know what drove me to want to get good grades all the time. I just had I guess it was the only reason I had to be alive. And um, so I looked at her and I said, no, I'm not going to your party. And she looked at me and all the guys that knew me were kind of looking up and kind of smiling and looking at me while I was talking to her. I said, I'm not going to your party. And she said, why? And, and honestly before you, what I'm going to tell you is the truth. I looked at her. It wasn't premeditated. It wasn't anything. I just looked at her and this is what I said. I said, I'm not going to your party now because I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm going to follow Him. When I said that, I saw her face and I saw my friends, acquaintances there in this company with me. I saw them look at me with the most shocked look on their face. Like, what on earth is this guy, is he pulling now? And, and it was like, have you seen those cartoons where this light bulb just goes click? Literally, it went, I, I, can, I can still remember the very moment. It went, it was just, and I looked at her, and she looked at me, and I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk out of this building right now, and I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. I love Jesus Christ, and I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. And I turned away from them. I gathered up my stuff and I started walking out of that library and literally, it was like someone was carrying me. All I knew is that I was loved by God and all my sins were gone. I mean, that's, that's all I knew. And that's why when I'm dealing with souls, you have to be very careful. I'm going to make a little theological statement here now. You have to be very, very careful because... We are saved by repentance and by faith. But at the initial stages of conversion, that always does not manifest itself the same way. For example, I was a wicked, wicked person, but I wasn't sitting there at that moment thinking how wicked I was. This wasn't a perfect Puritan demonstration of repentance. I wasn't thinking about that. All I knew is God loved me and I was reconciled. And I couldn't even use that word, but that's what I knew. Now you say, well, there was no repentance. Yes, there was it started manifesting itself. I mean, every day I would see more of how wicked I was and it would break my heart more and more. So, so when you're dealing with souls, you have to be very, very cautious. Because I've seen people who find very little assurance because they supposedly haven't had that perfect Puritan, uh, reformed conversion experience, but neither did Jonathan Edwards. But in the end, what happens? Repentance starts. Faith starts. I was so happy and I went towards the library door and I opened it up and there was a girl coming in that later I found out had been praying for me for six, like six months. Her and, and several others that were in the same apartment complex with me. And when I opened the door, she said, Paul! And I said, yeah? She said, what happened to you? I said, what do you mean? What happened to me? She goes, your face. She goes, you're just, you're just, what happened to you? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and I remember, I got scared. I knew I was a different human being. I was, diff I was a different man. And I just walked, ran. I would ran, run when no one would see me and walk when people were passing me by. I had to get back and I found that guy that was in my apartment and I said, Mike, I said, I'm scared. He said, what's wrong? I go, so I'm, I'm not me. 
anymore. I'm not me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm. And so he took me down to this guy who discipled him, who was a, the resident, you know, the overseer, who was a Christian, Mike Martin, big Texan. And so I knock on the door, and and Mike goes, "What's up?" And, and Mike said, "Tell him what's up," you know. And they were both named Mike. And uh, and I said, "I'm, I don't know. I." I believe in Jesus, and I'm not the same person that I was just an hour ago. And he goes, slaps me on the back, you know, big text, and he goes, Buddy, you've been born again. That's what he said. And I said, What is that? You know, what does that mean? And uh, so for about a month and a half, I mean, I was just, it was just glorious. All I could think about was Jesus. I remember the very next day, uh, they bought me a Ryrie study Bible. <laughs> and I had that New American Standard Ryrie study Bible. I took it to class. And then my friends were looking at me again like, what are you pulling, washer? I mean, what's this deal? I said, no, I've been born again. I'm not the same person. And I remember walking back the second day from class and there's a big crowd out on the student mall. And this guy's sitting there uh, kind of preaching, but he wasn't preaching. He was talking about... Um, humanism and, and free sex and all this different stuff and there is no morality. And I didn't know anything. But I got so angry. I knew he was a liar. And so I just went through the crowd. It's like something just picked me up and just pushed me. And I got right up to where he is and I said, Sir, in a very loud voice, you are a liar. And you're a deceiver and you're deceiving all these people. So that was my first sermon. Not a whole lot has changed since then. <laughs> and uh, and I, for about a month, everything was really going well because at times when God saves a person, He will literally immerse them in grace to protect them. And, um, and then a guy walks up to me and he goes, and I told him I'm a Christian. He goes, well, when did you pray the prayer? And I said, what? He goes, when did you pray the prayer? I said, what prayer? He goes, the prayer. And so he sat down with me and explained to me how you have to pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart. So I'm like, I didn't do that. And then for the next couple of months, at least six weeks, all the misery came back. Every day I would go and say, if I didn't pray this correctly, if I didn't pray this right, and prayed it again and again. And then one day I just realized, this is idiotic. I am a new creature. I became a new creature that day in the library. And, um, but here's what happened. When I was converted, I mean, like, I had a foul mouth. I mean, a foul mouth. And it, it stopped. Just like that. The drinking stopped. The other thing stopped. What did not stop was lying and exaggerating. You say, well, then you weren't saved because liars don't inherit the kingdom. Well, no, there was a big difference. I could tell a lie that big and it was like God drove a spear through my heart every time I would do it. And I would have to go back and it's, it's the most humbling thing in the world and go to my friend and say, I lied to you. Or I exaggerated this. I mean, it was like it was like daggers. It was horrible. It's like someone stuck a knife in your throat and just ripped down through your entire body every time. Again, God takes away certain things from our lives the moment we're converted. He allows other things to stay until He works through them progressively. And it causes us to walk in humility. It causes us not to leap and judge others. We know that this sanctification is a process. Well, um, I almost knew, this is really going to be kind of hard to understand, but I almost knew the moment that I was converted that I was also going to preach. And the reason why I knew that is because when I was a little boy, 14, 15 years old, 13, 12, I would have dreams at night and I could always see myself standing in front of a red curtain, a simple red curtain and a simple wooden pulpit and I was preaching. And I used to wake up 
crying and say, God, because I hated the idea of being a preacher. I said, I'll, I'll do anything. I'll get saved. I used to say that. If you'll just promise me that I don't have to preach. Because I don't want to do that. And um, so I kind of knew that this was something. And, um, and, and it was. It's just something that started coming and, and I felt like I had to witness to people. I can remember standing out on campus handing out tracts and, you know, girls would come by. The girls that used to, you know, I guess think I was something, I'd hand them tracts and they'd take them, laugh, and crumple them up in my face and throw them on the ground. My friends would come to me and they'd pull me aside and they'd go, what have you done? You joined a cult? What on earth are you doing? You're standing out here in the middle of the campus? People think you're out of your mind. And, and I remember asking them one time, three of them got me, and I said, do you believe that Jesus died? And they said, well, of course we do. You know, everybody knows that. He did that. Yeah, da, da. I go to church. You know. And I go, he died. They said, yes. I said, then what else can I do? I'm a prisoner now. I don't have any options. I'm his. And um, there were a lot of struggles and things that went on, but um, something that's really uh, I want to share with you is about two years ago, three years ago, uh, a person was talking with me and they said, Brother Paul, we don't want to exalt you or anything like that, but we just want to share with you, we thank you for two things. One, your bravery. That you will stand up and say the things you say even though men hate you. And two, that you tell the truth. They told me that, and I didn't think much about it, and then I got in my car, and I, I was driving back to the church where I was attending, and I got out of my car, and all of a sudden what they said hit me. And I began to weep uncontrollably. I had to go into the church and get in my office. And the reason why, I thought, look what they're saying. Courage and truth. Before I was a believer, even though I was strong, a lot of things. I was so intimidated by everybody. I think it was the reason why I lifted weights so much. I mean, I wouldn't even want to go into a Walmart and return something. You know, I mean, I just was afraid. Somebody would be angry or something. And then I, re I re looked back and thought, if there's one thing that, that set me apart in my life before Christ is I was a liar. I would lie more than any human being I've ever known. And I sit there and go, now I'm known as being courageous and telling the truth when I was the biggest coward and the biggest liar. Do you see that? Isn't that amazing? And I would still be, today, the biggest coward and the biggest liar if it were not for the grace of God. And I find it amazing that when I read the story, The Life of George Mueller, you know, he handled millions of dollars, died basically with nothing but the suit he had on his back, took care of tens of thousands of orphans. His, um, his reputation was his stewardship of finances. And yet before he was converted, he was a thief who stole money from his own father, was thrown in jail for ripping people off and not paying his debts. Isn't that amazing? God takes that which is not and makes it so that it is. That, that, that's, that means that it is all the grace of God. Sometimes I'll look at my children and I say, do you believe that I'm a good dad? And, and that I love your mom? And they'll say, yes, dad. And I'll go, the only reason you can say that is because of what God did for your dad. Because your dad would have never been able to marry, have a marriage, would have never been able to care for children because he was in bondage to his own vanity and sin. So anything good that you're receiving from this man is the recreating work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And um, after I was saved, I was very, very fortunate to go to a church. It was just an independent Baptist church, but independent not as a denomination. It was just a Baptist church. And the pastor there was one of the most unusual men that I ever met. 
he, he wasn't reformed. He wasn't anything like that. I've never seen to this day a man preach with more power. I've never seen a man so filled with the Holy Ghost. And while I was there, an old man by the name of Brother Pittman put some books in my hand. Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret, the autobiography of George Mueller, Leonard Ravenhill, Why Does Revival Terry, and these books about men who prayed. Not, not just prayed, prayed hours and hours and hours a day. And seeing a living example of the power of the Holy Spirit in front of me every Sunday, seeing these books made me realize something. Christianity, although it has to do with doctrine, and doctrine is foundational, it is, it is only that doctrine is foundation, foundational. It is about life and power. It is the power to live. Paul says, the power that works mightily within me. And I'll tell you this testimony because it is, it is absolutely, I cannot understand my life apart from it. For some reason, after a few years in my Christianity, God began to work in me a prayer life that I have never been able to duplicate since. It started out an hour a day, then two hours a day, sometimes three hours a day. Almost crazy. I worked at a cafeteria in order to support myself through school. As soon as I'd get back from there, I'd go to the library, get home from the library at 11 o'clock at night. I would pray till 1, 2, 3 in the morning, then get up in the morning at 7, go back to classes. Just, just It went on for months and months. I know this sounds almost crazy to you, but I decided I would... I would either know God or die. Now, I was a Christian. I knew God. I mean, I, I was born again. But there was this thing that I could know Him and that His power could be a reality in my life. And I've said, I'm going to go in this closet and I'm not coming out until either God meets with me. I didn't even know what that meant. God meets with me or I die. I fell asleep 15 minutes later and all my roommates came home about three hours later and found me asleep in the closet. They thought I had totally lost my mind. So I began to set an alarm clock every 15 minutes because I have until today because I work hard sometimes when I pray I fall asleep and so the alarm would go off it'd wake me back up I'd start praying I'd set it again and I, and for months all I prayed was this Lord it's been 47 days now and you still have not come you said if I sought you, I would find you. And then, Lord, it's been 93 days. And all I would do for hours is sit there and go, I'm waiting. I am not leaving. This is, I'm not leaving. And I would just sit there. Everybody went on a youth retreat, some kind of college retreat in the spring. I'll never forget that. And I knew that the Lord wanted me to go out into the hill country of West Texas. I went out there for three, three and a half days. And if someone had seen me, they would have called the authorities. I'm up on top of a hill. I'm, I got to the point I'm grabbing rocks and I'm throwing them as high as I can into the sky saying, did that hit the door? Did that hit the gate? Did you hear me? I'm still here. Where are you? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Went back to school. And one night, I was crying out to God. I didn't really know anything about prayer. I'd still been a Christian for only about a year or so. Crying out to God. I'm still here. Wait there three hours just saying, still here. Here I am. Still here. And all of a sudden, I just cried out, Father, please. Now some of you are going to disagree with me and, and I don't care. But at that moment, God 
came into that place in such a way that I was thrown down to the ground and I don't know how many hours I laid there in a fetal position covering my head with my arms thinking that I had somehow either blasphemed or he was sick and tired of what I was doing. I was so afraid. I laid there. I couldn't control my body. I don't know how long it went. I was convinced that there were fire trucks and police and everything outside of the apartment complex because there was probably some fire coming down from heaven. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, Please visit our website at heartcrymissionary.com. There you will find information about the ministry, our purpose, beliefs and methodologies, and extensive information about the missionaries we are privileged to serve.